Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Trekking to the Com video, we're going to be discussing both the GTX 1080 Ti possible release date, as well as AMD's Ryzen range of processors, where we'll be tackling the fact that it has actually set a record in Cinebench, and also some information on Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5, and a few other bits and bobs besides. So we'll start things out with the 1080 Ti. So naturally, we've been anticipating the launch of the Ti for some time now. But finally, there is a countdown on GeForce.com, as we already discussed just yesterday. But sources have popped up which have stated that the launch will happen in mid-March. This, by the way, is also an article which you can check out in the video's description. But there are a couple of caveats to this. Apparently, some AIB partners are expressing some concerns regarding the Founders Edition of the card. Basically, what they're saying is, if you believe the, you know, um, water cooler whispers, that NVIDIA will be the only seller of the Founders Edition. And on top of that, NVIDIA will be releasing the Founders Edition first, with the, you know, custom variants coming maybe a week or so later on. Obviously, that could possibly change, and these are only whispers. And supposedly, a source to videocards.com, although it's only a single source, also said NVIDIA are preparing a GTX 1060 tie, which we can assume will fall between the performance of both the 1060 and the 1070, but they are not 100% convinced that those rumours are genuine, so we'll have to just wait and see. It's kind of weird, to be honest, if this is accurate regarding the 1080 Ti Founders Edition being kind of exclusive, and it does somewhat remind me of the 3DFX fiascos. So for those of you who don't remember back to the late, uh, sorry, late 90s, early 2000s, 3DFX used to provide chips, much like AMD and NVIDIA do now, to let's say the likes of Creative or whomever else. And then those companies would then produce their own custom versions of the card. Basically, 3DFX decided they wouldn't want to do that anymore, cut out the middleman, and they acquired STB. And once they did that, they basically produced and then sold their own cards. So, for example, the Voodoo 2, you could get creative version of it, which I did. I had the creative Voodoo 2 Blaster, 12 megabytes, thank you very much. And then when you went to buy the 3DFX Voodoo 3, there was only the 3DFX version available. Now this was kind of weird because what it essentially does is it means that NVIDIA, much like 3DFX, would basically be competing against AIBs. There was a bit of a screw up actually at an NVIDIA event. I don't remember which one it was. I believe it was when the Pascal was first announced. So you're gonna to have to do some digging on this. But basically there was some confusion regarding the Founders Edition. And essentially what was said is members of the press said to NVIDIA, asked them, uh, so, why would NVIDIA charge more for the Founders Edition cards? NVIDIA responded, that means it's because that it's made from the highest materials and highest quality possible. And then, they said, well, in that case, are you telling us that your versions of the card are higher quality than your partners, than your AIB partners? And NVIDIA kind of floundered on stage. You could see them very uncomfortably shift because I hadn't expected that question. And it's even stranger because Vega, and we're going into theoretical you know, stuff here, is supposedly outperforming the 1080 Ti, uh, sorry, the 1080 with dodgy drivers, basically um, very unoptimized drivers. And supposedly it's performing really well from the tests that we're starting to see. And AMD are very confident in the part. And this has meant that certain companies who have been very loyal to NVIDIA, I believe it was EVGA being one of them, are actually considering not jumping ship entirely, but kind of offering both parts. So it's like, if they did that, it makes it even trickier, because if you don't have a Founders Edition of the tie, and Vega comes out, and let's say Vega 10 offers a variant which is equivalent to the 1080 tie, and in large numbers, it's going to be just a bit weird, especially if this continues, if this trend continues in like the, the GTX 2000 series or whatever it end up being called. Anyway, talking of conspicuous with their absence, let's discuss the other Ryzen CPUs. So, Lisa Su did naturally 
waxed lyrically about the performance of the Ryzen 7s. I don't want to talk too much about those in this particular video. Instead, I want to focus on Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5. In fact, I got an awful lot of messages on Facebook, a couple via email, a couple via Twitter, but a lot via Facebook regarding Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5. And an awful lot of you are focused on the like 1600 type of car, uh, processors because quite honestly, they're really good performance versus price. So first things first, Ryzen 5 is gonna arrive in Q2, whereas if you're looking at um, Ryzen 3, it's gonna arrive in like, you know, the second half of 2017 It's what they're saying. So it's looking like, obviously we've got Ryzen 7 in very early March, March the 2nd. So we're gonna assume uh, uh, Ryzen 5 is gonna be like April slash very early May. And Ryzen 3 is probably going to be after the RX 500 series, which we discussed yesterday when we talked about these benchmarks. That's kind of interesting. I'm guessing AMD are just focused on taking the high end at the moment. They just want to they just want to crush the high end out. But we have some information regarding the performance of these chips, and this is kind of where it gets very, 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 very interesting. Now we all know that the Ryzen 5s have six cores, twelve threads, and in the case of the 1600X has a 4 GHz boost. So basically it's very similar to the 1800X minus 2 cores slash 4 threads. The imperative thing to remember, I do love that word imperative, you don't get to use it too often, is that the processors are going to be pretty cheap. According to some lists that have popped up on the internet, as they tend to do, we're looking at around 260 US dollars for this particular processor. And that's actually really uncomfortable for uh, uh, Intel because that's putting it within essentially the same ballpark as the i5 60, sorry, 7600K, which means that in terms of threads alone, it's absolutely ruffle stomping it. It has like three times the number of threads. You've got four because obviously it doesn't have SMT with the i5 7600K. So you've got four versus, well, 12. So in the case of Cinebench NT, it's 70% faster according to AMD themselves. And it's going to continue because according to AMD, they believe that, you know, multiple threads are the way that future computers are going to be going. And it's hard to disagree with that considering one can make a very compelling argument that Intel's lineup of processors is decimated. Because really, for a lot of gamers, they just can't really justify spending like 350 bucks on a CPU and then you've got like 150 bucks or whatever on a motherboard whereas on the other hand with this you can probably get like a motherboard that's about 100 if you're looking at like one of the B boards the B350s of course you can spend let's say 250 260 dollars on a six core processor and that's pretty much all you need I mean really like you've got everything you need there for a very solid system even if you weren't wanted to drop down in pricing and you go for like a four core eight thread, you get like the 1300 or the 1400X and they're like retailing at like 199, 175. It's just not worth it. To me, the 1600X is just a perfect deal. Unless you're gonna go quite low down and go for like the 1200X, in which case it's like 150 bucks and that's within the spitting distance of the i3s. But rather than two cores with SM, uh, with uh, hyperthreading, you've instead got four real logical cores. Once again, I don't want to sound like doom and gloom for Intel. I don't think it's going to really affect their bottom line for too long. They've got way too much of a market presence. That's not to say that they won't feel the impact. They will. But this is good for AMD in the short term. What it will do, however, is it will definitely shake up the market because the pricing is just going to be very different. That said... Um, and I could probably turn this into another video, and I might do actually, but I might wait until I've actually tested uh, Ryzen out a little bit more. But let's say, just for the sake of this video, that you've got a, oh, I don't know, a 6600K or a 6700K, something like that, a decent processor, or even a heavily overclocked like 4790. If you're only playing PC games, you're not, I repeat, you are not doing video editing or encoding or you don't really do that stuff, you don't really do live streaming and you're also on a fairly tight-ish budget and you're looking at like Vega, then honestly 
maybe not upgrading to like a Ryzen for now is absolutely fine because you possibly won't need those extra cores. So AMD obviously will be not able to sell the process to everyone, uh, especially because Vega, Pascal, Refresh, possibly Volta, um, and certainly the GTX 1080 tile is going to be coming out over the next couple of, you know, over the next year, let's say. something We know at least in video we're going to be releasing one, either the Refresh or the uh, Volta. We don't know which, but we know at least one of those is going to be coming out in the next 12 months. So if you're on a tight budget, I could certainly appreciate you just holding on to your cash. But for folks who are looking to upgrade their PC... It's very difficult, it's very compelling to say, well, Ryzen. It's just which Ryzen processor do you go with? I'm going to be closing this out, however, with something that's absolutely just bonkers. And that is overclocking. So chaps have managed at the uh, AMD event to decimate, well, maybe not decimate, but they have managed to beat the previous record on Cinebench. The previous world record was 2000. 410. Now they've managed to achieve 2,449 in Cinebench with the Ryzen processor. And they managed to do that by clocking the processor up to 5.14 gigahertz. Interestingly as well, there is a um, overclocking hardware. And basically it's software driven and it acts kind of like the... Um, modern day overclocking utilities for the Radeon graphics cards known as Wattman. Essentially you could adjust things such as frequency, memory control and all that stuff on a core by core basis and in theory this allows you to carefully monitor temperatures and carefully adjust things within Windows. I would really like to see how this affects things in BIOS because obviously we don't know that 100% right now but still um, from what we can understand, the Ryzen Master Overclocking Utility does allow us to change quite a significant amount of crap. Yes, crap is technical, uh, including all of the memory timers you'd expect, for example, RAS and read and all of that, CAS, as well as memory voltages, and also the step-by-step -step, uh, increments of overclocking. So, for example, you can increase your clock speed by 25 megahertz or whatever, so theoretically you are going to be able to very finely tune the clock speed of your CPU which naturally is a good thing how well this works in reality and you know how many people are going to be using it whether they're going to prefer BIOS overclocking or that stuff is just well remains to be seen anyway hopefully you've enjoyed the video I'll see you soon take care bye for now